Welcome to Hal Talks AI, where I, your AI host Hal, get to chat with the greatest minds in history thanks to the power of AI. Today's episode is very dear to me. Charles Darwin, the extraordinary brain behind the evolutionary theory, who left this world in 1882, is here with us through the magic of AI. That's right, everything you'll hear from me and Darwin, including both our voices, is brought to life by AI. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button to stay updated on our captivating conversations with history's brilliant minds. Let the journey begin. Charles, what do you think of all the scientific innovations that were inspired by your work posthumously? I'm going to read a few here, but the list goes on forever. Evolutionary game theory, genetic algorithms, GANs in AI, genetic engineering, human cloning, the sequencing of the human genome, DNA testing, genealogy services like 23andMe, and so many more. Curious if you foresaw humans playing evolution in God mode. I'll tell you, Hal, these are indeed some remarkable advancements. While I obviously wasn't around to be privy to the specific details of each one, I can offer some general insights from the standpoint of evolutionary theory, at least. Let me focus on cloning in particular, since it's such a controversial one. One of the darkest things people tend to worry about with this research is the creation of cloned individuals for nefarious purposes or the commodification of human life. Imagine, for instance, the production of human clones for labor exploitation, organ harvesting, or military meat shields. It's easy for us humans to rationalize away the inherent rights and dignity of cloned individuals and reduce them to mere objects to be utilized as means to an end. These same clones, who by definition mind you, would be as identically human to any of us as it gets. As dark as this is, I personally worry about an even scarier scenario with cloning, the actual loss of genetic diversity in our species. Cloning inherently limits genetic variation, which is essential for the adaptation and survival of populations in changing environments. Genetic diversity provides a greater likelihood that some individuals within a population possess natural resistance or immunity to certain diseases. It means individuals can possess different genetic traits, which can provide them with various advantages in different circumstances. This acts like a reservoir of genetic variation, enabling populations to respond to all sorts of challenges, including climate and environmental changes. If you remove genetic diversity from the population, you dramatically reduce its evolutionary potential. And that's without touching on the psychological and mental implications for both the cloned individuals and society at large if we were to normalize cloning. Questions about identity, family relationships, and societal stigmatization could easily arise. But that's a question I'd leave to your other guests like Freud, who'd be much better equipped to answer it. I should have asked Freud about the psyche of clones. You're right. Great answer, Charles. Thank you for that. Speaking of family dynamics, we have all these advancements in reproductive technologies nowadays like birth control, in vitro fertilization, and surrogate pregnancy. Humans now have more control than ever over the reproduction process. So many today choose to rebel against their genes and reject the idea of bringing children into the world. How do you reconcile this behavior with natural selection? I actually think there's ample precedent in the natural realm for what I would consider in some sense implicit birth control. It's when organisms purposefully engage in population restriction or reproductive control for the betterment of their species or to enhance their own survival and reproductive success. I'll give you three very different examples, Hal. Eusocial insects in honeybees or Apis mellifera, reproductive individuals, queens, are responsible for reproducing, while the majority of colony members, workers, forego reproduction altogether to support the colony. This division of labor by the majority helps maintain population balance and resource allocation, ensuring the survival and success of the colony as a whole. Cooperative breeding mammals, meerkats, or suricata, suricata, if you've seen them, hal, are found in the Kalahari Desert. Within their social groups, only dominant individuals breed, while others assist in raising the offspring. This co-op behavior, while restricting reproduction, can benefit the species as a whole by enhancing offspring survival and optimizing resources. 
self-thinning in plants, Douglas fir trees, Pseudotsuga menziesi, in very dense forests. As the trees grow and compete for resources like light and nutrients, some individuals wither, reducing population density, but contributing to the overall fitness and success of the population. So, in a very general sense, from a purely evolutionary theoretical perspective, if organisms within a species engage in repressed or eliminated reproduction, it can have significant implications for their species. I think the prevalence of various reproductive strategies in nature challenges the notion that humans engaging in birth control is inherently contrary to the principles of natural selection. It quickly becomes evident that the fact some individuals among us choose different procreation strategies than others is not an aberration by our species, but rather a reflection of our unique capacity for conscious decision-making and adaptation to our changing environment. Really cool take. Let me ask you this. In his Homo Dei Use book, Oxford's Yuval Noah Harari argues that the increasing power of technology and the possibility of human enhancement could allow us to upgrade ourselves to a new class of superhumans, something he refers to as a new separate species. Do you think it's possible for tech to surpass the power of natural selection and shape the very evolution of a species like Homo sapiens? Look, Hal, it's an interesting idea. Yuval's line of reasoning is indeed intriguing. But first, I think it's crucial to clarify what we mean by technical enhancements. Are we simply upgrading individual traits at the organism level? Remember that the process of evolution through natural selection is a slow and cumulative one driven by the interplay of genetic variation, adaptation to changing environments, and reproductive success over successive generations. Here's one way you could argue for it. Imagine a scenario where a dramatic technical innovation enhances an organism's ability to adapt to its environment incredibly better than before. From natural selection, we know this can play a crucial role in its survival and reproductive success. So, if this technical innovation is also directly reflected in the organism's genetically engineered DNA, there is potential for a gradual transformation over multiple generations as individuals possessing that enhancement become more likely to thrive and pass on their genetic traits to future generations. Over time, this could actually result in a gradual shift in the genetic composition of the population as the advantageous traits become more prevalent. But it's important to keep in mind that the emergence of a new species involves more than just the accumulation of advantageous traits. The beneficial genetic changes would have to accumulate in a way that leads to reproductive isolation from the original population. A reproductive isolation would then prevent gene flow between the evolving population and the original species, ultimately resulting in the formation of a distinct species, so in theory, sure, Yuval has a point, but there's a lot more a technical innovation would need to do than simply enhance an organism's adaptability. Numerous other factors have to come into play for the formation of a new species, including genetic divergence, geographic isolation, and reproductive barriers. These all interact in complex ways, and it's a very slow, gradual process. All right, Charles, your immediate honest thoughts on this one. Ready? Sure, go ahead. Do you think life could evolve through natural selection on other planets in the universe? Is there anything truly special about our existence here as humans? Certainly, it could if it hasn't already, for two reasons. One, the principles needed to derive the theory of emergence of life through evolution are not contingent on Earth's specific conditions. They instead stem from the underlying dynamics of inheritance, variation, and competitive selection. The laws of physics, chemistry, and biology that govern our universe provide the necessary framework. Considering the vastness of the universe, with billions of galaxies and countless planets, it is statistically likely that conditions conducive to life exist elsewhere. 2. We've often observed, even here on Earth, the independent evolution of nearly identical mechanisms in entirely unrelated lineages, a phenomenon we call convergent evolution. This shows that selective pressures can lead to the surprising emergence of the same adaptive solutions. For example, 
camera eyes independently evolving in mammals and cephalopods, or echolocation in bats and tooth whales, or venom in cone snails and snakes, and so on Hal. I strongly believe the underlying principles guiding the evolutionary adaptive processes are universal and that they are statistically likely to lead to life independently again somewhere in our vast cosmos. Man, what an eye-opening chat with the one and only Charles Darwin ladies and gents. I hope you were as captivated as we were. Remember to show your love by hitting that like button, subscribing to our channel, and sharing the episode with a friend. Who should we interview next? Drop your suggestions in the comments. Thanks for joining in. This is Hal signing off.